And so, Lord God, thank you for taking us on this journey. And I pray that you would take us on a journey now that you would cause us, Lord God, to preach your word through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Sixty uh, years, three months, and 27 days ago, one billion, one billion stood poised and ready on red alert in the epididymis. At just the right moment, all systems were go, and they surged forth into the vast deferens, up the ductus deferens, past the seminal vesicles, and into the urethra, from whence they were thrust into the fray of the vaginal cavity. A furious battle ensued, a race for survival. Hundreds, hundreds of millions were lost and would soon die. However, a few, the proud, the strong, a few million made it to the cervix. Although countless billions, nay, trillions, had been turned back at this point on this particular day, at this particular moment, the mucosal barrier had reached the perfect level of viscosity and permeability. The gate was open. Hundreds of thousands perished, racing to their death in the wrong fallopian tube, and of those that chose correctly, countless thousands still perished in the endless folds of the fallopian structure. But a few, a few, out of the one billion, a few, a select few, made it to the vicinity of the fertile and ripened ovum, and out of those few, only one, only one out of a billion reached that final goal. And I am that one. I am the sperm that made it. When people say, Peter, you're not so special, you're not so super, I can say, wrong! Out of a billion, nay, a trillion, I am the sperm that made it. That's what I learned in 1969 at South Elementary School in Littleton, Colorado. I'm the sperm that made it, and life is the survival of the fittest. Sadly, I soon realized that there were roughly, at that time, five billion other people in the world, and apparently life was still the survival of the fittest, and so to be super, you had to make someone else, uh, preferably five billion other else's, uh, feel not so super. At recess, my friends Duncan and Matt like to play Batman and Robin, and the other boys like to beat them up. I think it made them feel super. I remember standing at the edge of the crowd just not knowing what to do. It was tempting to join the crowd and I was utterly terrified of joining Matt and Duncan weeping in the dirt. What is it that makes someone super? I preach to you the Superman, wrote Friedrich Nietzsche, what is good all that heightens in man, the feeling of power, the desire for power. Power itself, what is bad, all that comes from weakness. What is more harmful than any vice, pity for the condition of the ineffectives and weak slash Christianity. Adolf Hitler was perhaps uh, Nietzsche's most ardent disciple. But it wasn't just Hitler that, that thought this way. It was all the kids at South Elementary School. I kind of think we all think this way. Most people seem to think it's the American dream. I've discovered it's the reason that, seriously, most folks go to church. I think it's what Paul refers to as the flesh. It's the desire to exalt yourself by humiliating others it's the desire to compete. We all want to be super, and we all are kind of aware that we're not super. To use Paul's terminology, we all want to be right or righteous, and we're aware that we're, well, kind of wrong. Last week we started talking about the superman, the eschatos man, Jesus. 
We talked about the fact that if you try to make yourself into the Superman by taking knowledge of the Superman, you end up crucifying the Superman and everything dies. But if you surrender to the Superman and believe the word of God that is the Superman, what was dead begins to live because the word of God is a seed, an imperishable seed, a promise seed. In Greek, a sperma. Let's go! Yeah! Do you know that Superman gets his energy from the sun? Okay, I'm ready to go up. Last week we noted that those two boys probably did not dress up um, in a red cape and leotards and run around the yard because someone said, you know what, you should try to be more like Superman. That's not how you become Superman. That's how you become an old man, <laughs> a tired old, old man, an old Adam. We conjectured that they dressed up like Superman and Spider-Man because they saw a show about those superheroes and they like fell in love with those superheroes. And they didn't just see the show in a theater, they uh, saw uh, the show in, in the eyes of someone that loved them, someone that said, hey buddy, <laughs> I think you're super. That's my judgment. And did you know Superman wasn't intimidated by Spider-Man? Did you notice that? And Spider-Man was not intimidated by Superman. They could both be super, in their own particular way. They weren't trying to be supermen for fear that they weren't supermen. They were celebrating Superman and the fact that someone thought they were super. In other words, it was their birthright. And that's how you become Superman. You receive the promise like a seed, for it is the seed. It's Christ in you. The hope of glory is what Paul calls it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, you can't make yourself Jesus, but Jesus can make you himself. And when you see that, when you see that, that he has, by literally giving you his life, uh, everything will be super. And you will begin to rejoice without ceasing. That's where we left off last time, Romans 5.11, okay? Next verse, Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, is added by the translator, but before the law. But sin is not counted where there's no law. Yet death reigned, from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression, which is a violation of law, that's what the word means, the transgression of Adam, who not was, now this is important, the translator just changed the verb tense here, but in Greek, who is a type of the one literally being about to be. The one being about to be is the eschatos Adam, the eschatos man, the uttermost man, the superman. That's what Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, when he writes this. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last, eschatos Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Now, in my experience, very few people actually believe what we just read, and that's largely because we modern people, seriously, we do not have mental categories for what we just read. So let me remind you of a couple of things. Number one, Adam is a collective singular noun in Hebrew, which appears um, something like 552 times in the Old Testament 
and is usually translated man. It only appears as an obviously proper name, you know, like Bob or Steve or Jim, six times in the Old Testament. And check this out. None of those times are in the first three chapters of Genesis, even though people debate a, a few of them. 140 times it appears with a definite article inter- emphasizing the fact that, that man is the man. We saw that when we preached through Ecclesiastes. Humanity is one single man that includes women, praise God, Adam. In the view of the Old Testament, all people are really one man, Adam. So if Adam is a type of the one being about to be, then you, me, and us are also a type of the one being about to be, okay? Number two, because we are Adam, and because Paul doesn't buy the the antiquated modern notion that chronological time is absolute, he doesn't think that the garden story is only about two naked people somewhere in the distant past. He thinks it's about me and you and Jesus, the eschatos Adam, who is the beginning and end of all space and time, including the beginning and the end of your space and time. Paul's an Old Testament scholar, and the Old Testament talks in a few places about little children as not yet having the knowledge of good and evil. That's because little children haven't yet got to that part of the story quite yet. In the Old Testament, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, people don't inherit guilt but they do inherit the propensity to transgress the law. For we are all born without the knowledge of good and evil. We haven't yet taken it from the tree. That's why people aren't into blaming babies. What's wrong with this world today? The stupid babies. They make all the wrong decisions. So nobody blames babies. Babies haven't yet taken knowledge from the tree. And they don't yet recognize their helper, our helper. According to scripture, God is our helper, our azer. God is good, he is the good, but without knowledge of the good, how could we have faith in the good? Who is God? God is love, but without faith in love, how could we be anything but alone? Even before the fall, God says it's not good that the Adam is alone, not good. Adam is alone in the presence of love. For Adam doesn't have faith in love, who is God, his helper. Sin is an absence of faith. So sin was in Adam and in the world before Adam ever encountered the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the same way, every baby has sin, But we don't call it sin until we give them some laws, right? That is some knowledge of good and and evil. But, But we hope that one day those babies won't need those laws for they will have grown up to have faith. In what? In love. And like we said last time, faith in love is what makes the Superman super. God is love and love can raise the dead. God's the... God's the author of the story. That's the power of every superhero is they're the the apple of the author's eye. So everything works for the good, for the superhero. Well, faith in love is Superman's superpower. So anyway, very few, I really mean this, very few, if any, actually believe what I just read or what I'm about to read. But but if, if we did believe, I think we'd have a reformation. And all sorts of dark things would suddenly become wonderfully bright and radiate light, and all of us would put on leotards and a red cape, and I think we'd start running around the yard a little more, like two five-year-old boys celebrating Superman. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law, but sin is not counted where there's no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression, the violation of a law of Adam, who is, who is a type of the one being about to be. But the free gift is not like 
the trespass, paraptoma, the fall. For if many died through one man's trespass, how many died? Well, he already told us, all, right? Many is all, which is often the case with Hebrew and Aramaic. Many is all. But much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Many is all. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those receiving the abundance of grace and the free gift of grace reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Much more, writes Paul. That means the power of the free gift was much more than the power of the trespass. trespass. Now, the evil one wants you to think it's the opposite way around, but that's what Paul just said. So who are those receiving the free gift? Paul wants to be clear about this. Next verse. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Is, is that clear? Literally translated as justification of life for all men. So according to Paul, because we're keeping track of this going through Romans, okay, we're justified, we're made right by these things. Grace is a gift, the faith of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and now life, and we all know that Jesus is the life. Do you get the idea that Jesus does all the heavy lifting here? That's because he's super! Okay, verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification of life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made or constituted or appointed sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made, constituted, or appointed righteous. Now the law came in, now this is fascinating, but peres erkomai, um, there's a regular word for, for come, and that's erkomai. Paris erkomai means like to come by deception or by stealth, to sneak. The law snuck in, or the law came in, to increase the trespass. <laughs> but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this is not some obscure scripture somewhere in the Old Testament. This is the very crux of Paul's systematic theology in the epistle to the Romans. 20 years ago, I lost my ability to explain it away. And for 20 years, I've been wondering why on earth would anyone, particularly the church, want to explain it away? We're only gonna skim the surface this morning, but I hope, I hope that you hold these ideas deep in your heart like a seed an imperishable seed, the logos, or the logic of, of God. Verse 14, Paul wrote this. Adam is a type of the one being about to be, but, but not just any old type, as we use the word type in the English language. Tupos is the Greek noun that gets translated as type, and it comes from this Greek word that means to, to, to strike. And so sometimes it's translated as imprint. Now, I'm gonna make a tupas for you, okay? So you, so you get it, so you understand. And to do it, I'm gonna to need to use the Superman figurine from our last sermon, okay? So, so this is the eschatos man, remember? This is Superman, this is, this is the judgment of God, this is the word of God by whom everything that's anything, all things are created. Um, the eschatos, the eschatos man who is being about to be. <laughs> and, and this, this is um, molding clay from Hobby Lobby that Susan picked up for me because I make a policy of not going to that place. But anyway, this is molding clay from Hobby Lobby. And uh, you may remember that in Genesis chapter 2, Scripture says that Adam was made when God, whew, he he breathed, he spirited into the clay, and Adam became a, a living nephesh, a, a soul. So anyway, this is the, that's the molding clay, and if I take the Superman and I, I press him into the clay, 
And then I remove them from the clay, put them back here, okay? There you go, buddy. I put you right back high and lift it up on your stand. Okay. If he stays there, I don't know. Okay. See this? This is the two paws. Paul says, this is you. This is Adam, the, the imprint. So this pattern in the clay is uh, the tupas, humanity. This is you and me and us, and this is Jesus, <laughs> the one who is coming, the one who is being about to be. This is old Adam, and this is the last Adam, the eschatos man. Now, can you see that? Okay, I'll move this stuff there. So, Can you zoom in on that, Glenn? Zoom in on that? Okay, so what does this mean? <laughs> you see, I think it means so much. I just started writing some things down, and we're only gonna skim the surface now, okay? Right, but here's some ideas. Number one, it means that Jesus is the beginning and the end of you. Do you see that the beginning and the end are the same? It also means this, that, that if, 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 you're, if you haven't come to Jesus yet, you're not at the end. So if you feel like you're in hell, just keep walking, okay? Number two, it means that we are being created, and check this out, we're conscious of being created. We're observing our own creation. We, we tend to think that we were created, it was finished, we mess it all up, and now things you know, need to get fixed somehow, and we're all trying to figure out how to do that. But this means that we are being created, and we're not finished until he is, until he is in us, and we are eternal in him, eternal. So actually, actually, everything is going according to plan, and it can't do anything other than going according to plan. Why? Well, because, um, the eschatos man is eternal. Superman's eternal. Number three, it means that you and me and us, as we currently experience ourselves, now this is weird, we are like the presence of an absence of the one being about to be. And who is he? Well, he is the manifest presence of God. He's the judgment of God, the logic of God. He's the good, the light, the way, the truth, and the life. Hey, do you ever long for life? Do you ever long for truth and direction for the way? For enlightenment, for goodness? Do you ever long for sanity? <laughs> do you just ever wish that everything would be right? Well, you see, this means that every bit of longing in you corresponds directly to a fulfillment that is him. In fact, you can only ask what is wrong, and now this just is really hard for atheists to stomach, but it's true. You can only ask what is wrong because you are a creation of what is right. <laughs> Who is right? and who is your righteousness. Number five, this means that the reason for wrong is to create a desire for what's right, leading to the revelation of the right, which makes you right, which actually makes you him, the Superman. In his book, Christ and Adam, which is entirely about the verses we just read, Karl Barth writes this. The guilt and punishment we incur in Adam have no independent reality of their own. This has no independent reality from this, in other words. But are only the dark shadow of the grace and life we have in Christ. We have come to Christ as believers and Christians because we had already come from Christ, so that there was nothing else for us to do but believe in him. What is Christian is secretly but fundamentally identical with what is universally human. Nothing in true human nature can ever be alien or irrelevant to the Christian. Nothing in true human nature can ever attack or surpass or annul the objective reality of the Christian's union with Christ. So it is Christ that reveals the true nature of man. Man's nature 
in Adam is not, as is usually assumed, his true and original nature. It is only truly human at all insofar as it reflects and corresponds to the essential human nature as it is found in Christ, the one being about to be. And check this out. The one being about to be, Christ, the eschatos Adam, is eternal. However, his imprint in the dust of space and time is not eternal. It's temporal, which implies that number six, now think hard about this, who it is that you think you are is who it is that you actually are not. It is a temporal illusion, a false self, an old Adam, to use the words of Paul. Now, I, I doubt if I can explain all of this correctly to you or how it comes to be, but it's fascinating to think about. It appears that we were each created as something not yet fully created, like a little child. We're each like a, a piece of clay that contains an empty space, which is a lack of faith in God. On the, on the sixth day of creation, Adam was with his helper, but couldn't find his helper, whom we discovered to be God. That's what the rest of Scripture is really about. Adam was alone in the presence of love. So God said it is not good that the Adam is alone or should be alone. Not good is evil. And a lack of faith in love is sin. So Adam was not entirely good, and sin was already in Adam and in the world when God placed that tree in the middle of the garden. Romans 5.20, Paul writes this. The law came in or, or snuck in to increase the trespass. Law, you know, is a particular type of the knowledge of good and evil. It's knowledge about the good, right? It's a description of the good, but it's not the good. So I can know about my wife, Susan, and I can have a description of my wife, Susan, and yet I can also know Susan and be known by Susan, praise God. And that can even result in babies, but that's a whole different sermon. But there are different ways of, of knowing. The law came in to increase the trespass, writes Paul. So why did God put that tree in the middle of the garden and then, and then allow the snake to you know, like sneak in and tempt Eve and that first Adam to take its fruit? And, and why did God actively give that knowledge, that law in stone uh, to Moses on Mount Sinai. Answer, to increase the trespass, according to Paul. Whew. In the next chapter, Paul is going to start talking about the old self, literally the old man, the old Adam, the body of sin and death, the flesh. Paul seems to think that God put the tree in the garden, let the snake sink into the garden, and led Adam into temptation so that the tupas, so that the tupas, would increase. The law came in to increase the trespass. Satan tempted, but, but you know what? God is always using Satan. It's no wonder that Satan's just always pissed. God always uses him. But why would God do that? And how exactly did the law come in? And does the law come in, literally sneak in? Well, think about the, think about the two paws for, for, for a minute. What is it? Just, just look at it. It's like the knowledge of Superman, right? That's what Superman is about, with an absence of the Superman. It's knowledge of the good that takes the form of an absence, the absence of, of the good. It's knowledge of the life that is an absence of the life. It's knowledge of love that is an absence of love. And what is the law? Well, it's knowledge of goodness, life, and love that is not goodness, life, and love. It's like the memory of goodness, life, and love that is now dead. That's why you should, but you don't. It's dead. Remember the serpent's temptation in the garden. Take knowledge of God, because that's what he's saying to Eve, right? Take knowledge of God, knowledge of the good, knowledge of the life. Take knowledge uh, of God, make yourself in the image of God, and, and it turns out that in this way we crucify God. Every transgression is a decision to make myself God. And every transgression 
creates an absence of God that is also a knowledge of God that is an experience of guilt. (sighs) A body of sin and death. So I'm saying with sins, I construct the old man who longs for and yet is terrified of the new man, the eschatos Adam. Do you remember what Jesus said to the Jews in John 8? He said, you are of your father, the devil. He's the father of lies. You see, the devil's not the father of real people, only false people. And yet even false people can only be made by, made by, by abusing that which is, is true. Satan does it by sowing a seed in your empty self, your empty soul, a seed that isn't a seed but a lie, the lie that you can take knowledge of the good and make yourself good. In other words, that you can be self-righteous, that you can create yourself, save yourself, and justify yourself, that you can make yourself God, who is the good, but you can't make yourself good. You can only make yourself evil. And you have made yourself evil. Because Satan sowed a doubt, he made it a want, and we all crucified the Christ. And yet, and yet, Paul is arguing that this is all going according to plan. This is God's, this is God's, this is God's plan. Romans 5.20, now the law came in to increase the trespass, the, the fall, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It seems that God wants grace to just like abound. He loves grace. He wants grace to abound. Maybe that's so that you would abound. Sin is our own bad judgment, right? It's how the old man is formed, a seed of doubt that becomes a want that crucifies the life. But grace is God's good judgment and how the new man is formed. Grace is a promise implanted like a seed that becomes a hope that gets filled with the life of love and God is love, he's free love, he's grace. And where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Perhaps sin increased in you so grace would abound in you. And I mean you, the quirky, weird, unique vessel that is, that is you. That means, number seven, God is glorified in you, even as the new you, the particular you, the particular, quirky, glorious, weird vessel that is the new you. It's like C.S. Lewis writes, be sure that the ins and outs of your individuality are no mystery to him. And one day they will no longer be a mystery to you. The mold in which a key is made would be a strange thing if you had never seen a lock Your soul has a curious shape because it is a hollow made to fit a particular swelling in the infinite contours of the divine substance. That that means, number eight, all things work together for the good with them that love God. In the words of St. Augustine, even your sin. That means, number nine, no regrets. This is a hard one to stomach, but even your bad judgments are part somehow of God's good judgment. So sorrow then turns into laughter. Mourning turns into dancing. Sin turns into the glory of grace. And Rabbi Saul of Tarsus turns into St. Paul, the apostle of grace, free grace. And so number 10, it was all predestined. (laughs) Double predestined, in fact. You were predestined for wrath because you are predestined to glory. Number 11, your old man, the tupas, is a vessel of wrath. Vessel of wrath that is transformed into the vessel of mercy, a vessel of mercy, the vessel of glory, when, when the one being about to be comes to you, like he came to Paul <laughs> on the road to Damascus. Now pay attention. Uh, get get them down here, high and lift it up. Your old man is dead. That's what Paul's telling us. <laughs> and the new man is life. Salvation is the death of death.
which is the presence of life. The judgment of God. And see, that means the moment of your annihilation is also the moment of your consummation and creation. When you um, rise from the dead with Jesus. Number 13, salvation is a revelation that you are the creation of love. You are your own desecration. You can make a bad choice. You are your own desecration, but you are not your own creation. You are the creation of love. And check this out, so is your neighbor. Like I mentioned at the start, Scripture seems to view all of us as one Adam, the first Adam, who gets filled with the eschatos Adam. That's all one Adam. And that means that, that, that our tupas, our tupas must look something like this, our tupas. But perhaps your individual tupas looks uh, something more like this. Like, I'm sorry, Superman, I'm using you again. I, if, I, if I took Superman, maybe your individual tupas looks something like this, and I just pressed his, his hand into the clay. Maybe that's your tupas, and, and my, my individual and unique tupas, maybe I'm the, I'm the left foot of Superman, all right? So he presses the left foot into there. Uh, maybe that's me. Now, imagine if uh, someone were to come along and and say to me, uh, you, the left foot of Superman, need to make yourself Superman. That's your, re your responsibility. Your responsibility is to make yourself this. Well, how would I then relate to this? <laughs> uh, the imprint of the hand, the two paws of the hand. Well, I might be kind of intimidated by this. I might want to consume this. I might want to, maybe I'd compete with, with this. I would try to make this into, into this in order that I could make myself into this. In other words, I would try to be the sperm that made it and never be able to make it and always be alone. And that's not life. That's death. If I thought that I, the foot, had to make myself the Superman, everyone would become my enemy, and I would be forever alone and dead. But if I thought that, that this, the life, the Superman, was making me, the foot himself, then every other person might be a gift. And I would never be alone, and I might even start to come to life. Life is not a competition. A biologist will tell you this too. Life is a cooperation. Life is a communion. And Jesus is the life. A few messages ago in Romans 3, we talked about penal substitutionary atonement theory. It was developed during the Reformation. It's the idea that Jesus was punished in our place. But I prefer the recapitulation theory of the atonement because it's biblical. And it was articulated, probably first, outside the Bible by Irenaeus in the second century AD. It's the idea that Jesus recapitulates or reconstitutes Adam, but not just the first Adam, but the first Adam as the second Adam, the eschatos Adam, the last Adam. It's Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, Ephesians 1.10. The plan for the fullness of time is to bring together, and a kephalio, unite together under one head, all things in Christ Jesus. It's the idea that when that first Adam, who was us, by the way, swallowed the lie of the evil one, we uncreated ourselves. <laughs> we tore ourselves apart into a million pieces as we each tried to make ourselves the image of God and so crucified the image of God at the tree in the garden. But when the last Adam delivered himself up on the tree in the garden, he made himself a life-giving spirit. And God sowed that spirit like a, like a seed, like a seed into every fallen piece of of Adam. <laughs> that seed is the faith of the eschatos man, the superman, who is the judgment of God. The, the judgment of God, check this out, is not imposed from the outside. 
it's planted on the inside so that we wouldn't be forced to live, love, and manifest the beauty that is God, but we would freely choose to live, love, and manifest the beauty of God. We would freely choose to be ourselves, and we would enjoy being ourselves, a symphony of self-giving love, the image of God, the body of Christ. You see, this means, number 14, every child of Adam is predestined for freedom. Number 15, no man is your enemy. And every man, every woman is a gift, a gift that actually turns out to be yourself. Number 16, no man is your enemy, but lies, arrogance, and dis... You do have an enemy. Lies, arrogance, and disunity are your enemy. Number 17, it means that you are made for God, and everyone, check this out, everyone is made for you. Yep, Donald Trump is made for you. And Joe Biden is made for you. You just have to figure out how to deal with that. But anyway, number 18, it means that if you need someone to lose, you do not yet understand what it means to win, for you haven't yet met the Superman. Number 19, the Superman is the eschatos man, the ultimate man, but that can also be translated the last and the very least man, and he is. Because number 20, life is not the survival of the fittest, it's the sacrifice of the fittest. What makes Superman super is that although he was first, he freely chose to be last. Although he was exalted, he chose to be humbled, that we could all be exalted. Although he was Superman, he chose to be every man. Irenaeus wrote, he who was the son of God became the son of man, that man might become the son of God. Number 21, the Son of God is the Son of Man because he chose to be born of you. I guess that's like a womb. <laughs> when we come to the communion table, we bring the old man, the Tupas. We bring him back to the tree on the holy mountain we confess that we have taken the life and desecrated the image, and we receive the life, and we are created in the image. His judgment replaces our judgment as his blood begins to flow in our empty veins, binding us together with the logic of love. That's faith in grace. Years ago, a man approached me after a worship service, it was, I think, a Wednesday night up on the mountain where we had talked about the old man and the new man, and he said something like this. He said, Peter, I just want you to know I, I think I get what you're saying. I'm a sculptor. And, and he was really a master of his craft. You can still see, like, his works of art, I think, in parks around town, like bronze elk and stuff like that. He said, whenever I make a piece of art, I first form it in wax, then I coat the wax in clay, and then I fire the clay. I baptize the whole thing in, in fire. When I do, the wax melts out, leaving a void. That's like the old man. And then I take molten bronze or gold. Scripture, you know, describes faith as molten metal, and I pour it into the void. It's how I make a masterpiece. And then he said, Peter, it's always been a spiritual experience for me. That moment when I break that old earthen vessel and I see the glory inside, it has always filled me with awe and given me shivers, and now I know why. As you come to the communion table this morning, may you surrender the two paws. <laughs> the old self, and let the Superman fill you with himself, the glory of God. He broke the bread, saying, this is my body given to you. And he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant. <laughs> this is the promise, this is the judgment, this is the will of God in my blood poured out for you. Drink of it, all of you. And do it in re 
remembrance of me. <laughs> kind of looks like a workbench, doesn't it? That's because it is. And you are his masterpiece. So anyway, people often want to know uh, at the end of the sermon, so what do I do? Like, do I write a letter to my mom? Do I give 10% to the church? What do I do? Repent. Seriously. That means think differently about Abed over in Syria. Think differently about your own crap and the story of your life. Repent. Number 22, you cannot make yourself into Superman, but Superman is making you into himself. You're not the sperm that made it. No, I should say this. You are the sperm that made it. You're not just the sperm that made it. You are somehow, by grace through faith, <laughs> the sperma that made everything. <laughs> I don't even know how to talk about that. So I'll just quote Paul. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God, writes Paul in Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So, in other words, repent. And you'll never see Abed the same again. You'll never see yourself the same again. You'll never breathe the same way again. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen. And now if you'd like prayer, uh, members of the prayer team would be down front. They'd love to pray with you. Oh, and I should mention this too. If during the sermon at some point you thought to yourself, you followed the logic, okay, and you thought, hmm, maybe I should sin that grace may abound. Well, keep reading in Romans. Next sentence. Shall we sin that grace may abound? Hell no. We'll talk about that in two weeks. But have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week.